I don't know. I don't. Hi, Jen. Hey, Suzanne Clark. It's Good Molly, actually. <laughs> I don't and, have the bandwidth for video, uh, but I came in to hit record. Oh, cool. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I wasn't I wasn't wise enough to get in touch with you or Molly or somebody about recording the first session, but you all hear me all the time, so that's no big deal. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, we, we will be uh, recording you tonight for prosperity and to put up. Um, I also want to tell everyone that, and Suzanne, I will get to you um, Steve Scott's two presentations uh, on capitalism that he gave to the congregation. So people can read that, look at that um, to compare to, thanks Suzanne, um, look at what we've been talking about um, and put it in our archives with the rest of the material. So I wanna wait a few more minutes, of course, um, to see who else we have tonight. I'm getting a little better with the technology. How you do it with the technology, William? <laughs> yeah, it took some time to get used to. But oh they, my goodness. So are time, you all going back in seat? Um at Bethune? It, it's sort of um still up in the air. They have um a desire to reopen campus. Okay. Uh, you know, schools like ours depend on tuition and, sure, and sure. residents. But the plan is really not thought out well. And um, I don't know how, how I see anyone. I mean, they're concentrating on freshmen coming in because they assume that if the freshmen don't come in, then they have no reason to do online study. Um, mm. So I don't know. It just seems to me. Wow. Tough, tough decision. And I'm sure all of you know that Professor Rodriguez lives in Florida. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Florida. And, and teaches in Florida uh, oh. at Bethune Cookman University in Daytona Beach. And so, uh, uh, thinking, about, thinking about meeting in person takes on a whole new, new mm -hmm. level of concern. Mm -hmm. But, with us too. Um, I don't know if anyone heard, but I, I heard here in Boone County, we had another death. Did anyone yeah. hear that? I heard yesterday? that a third one, uh, someone in Three. their mid, mid, uh, mid forties or something. So, wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. These are interesting times. <laughs> So I read today that a man 43 stabbed a man 77 years old because the 77-year-old uh, was the storekeeper and he confronted him about wearing a mask. The man refused. They got into an argument and he stabbed him. <laughs> oh my gosh, did, did, did he, uh, it was, was it mortal or did he die? No, he did not die. He is in serious condition, but it looks like he's going to pull through. But that just adds another level. You know, you're in the store. I, I don't know about you all, but when I'm someplace, when I have to be at, like in the store and people pull too close to me, I'm like, you know, I love you, but you got to back up. I, I got to have room. And I wear my mask everywhere. Um, this is just too serious, but, um, you have to be careful if you confront someone, Stephen, because they can stab you, <laughs> you know, that's just crazy. The irony of that is that he didn't want to wear a mask for his freedom, but then forfeited his freedom by stabbing somebody else. <laughs> yeah. They, they did. 
They did apprehend him then, I assume. Yes, they did apprehend the man who stabbed uh, the storekeeper. So, yeah, these are crazy times. Well, thanks, you all, those of you who are here. Uh, it's good to see everybody. I hope everybody is healthy and well. Hey, Fred. Um, and uh, thank you again for attending. Let me, uh, let me uh, again remind you that... Uh, for the lecture tonight, we put that, uh, I, I sent out an all um, UU um, email to all of you with the material for Professor Rodriguez's talk tonight, as well as yesterday I sent to you an outline. Um, I hope everyone received it so that, uh, hi Diane, that we can follow, we can follow uh, well, the lecture tonight. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm real excited, if you can't tell. Um, William and I have not seen each other since 2013, something like that. Um, he and I served together at Bethune-Cookman University, where I first uh, met Professor Rodriguez. Um, he and I and... Um, a cat by the name of um, Louis Colombo um, mm -hmm. put together um, an ethics introduction to ethics book, I think in 2010, something like that. Is that about right, William? Yeah. And um, so um, it's good to see him. It's good to see he's well. I'm glad he could take time from his busy schedule to come and be with us. Um, the format will be as we usually do. Uh, we will op we will uh, allow uh, Professor Rodriguez to begin uh, the lecture, and then we will, at the end, um, open it up so that we can ask questions um, about about the material. We will again be recording tonight so that we have it. Uh, are there any preliminary questions? that any of you have before we begin. I, I, I got a whole bunch of questions. Uh, so, uh, William, if you would please, uh, we are in your hands. Okay. Uh, would it be useful if I uh, projected the, um, the handouts I sent you? Or, would that help, ladies and gentlemen? Yes? Yes. I didn't get something today. I got something from the day before, but I didn't get anything today. No, nothing today. So, yes, um, William, if you don't mind, yes. Is that um, showing? Ah, very good. Oh, that's very helpful. Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, I wanted to begin by thanking um, CW for inviting me and for the church um, to um, have me with you this evening. Um, it, it's a pleasure for me to talk to people um, who are engaged, um, who read the material, <laughs> <laughs> and, and will bring something to the conversation. Um, insights as well um, as you know, we think through these issues. Um, just as a way of introducing myself, I'm from um, the little island of Puerto Rico that I just discovered was for sale after the uh, Hurricane Maria. <laughs> and um, I grew up in New York City. Um, and so I did my doctoral work at uh, Florida State University, thinking I would come here to Florida just to do my education. And I get myself back to New York and I've never gone back home. So here I am. Um, so my, my dissertation at the point at when I wrote it in 2003 had to do with economics um, and globalization. Um, and, and I was looking at it that based on a book that was written by Thomas Friedman, who's a, um, he writes about culture and he writes about economics for the New York Times. Uh, the book was entitled The Lexus and the Olive Tree. I um, mean, in that book, he talked about the promise and, and did a good job trying to sell globalization as something 
good for everyone and how the United States as well as the world stood to benefit from it. Um, I, I saw globalized capitalism as a two-edged sword. Um, it has a promise, but it also has a greater deal of peril. Um, and I thought it was sort of like a Faustian bargain, right? We're making a bargain with the devil. Um, we're allowing for this global capitalism to losing our soul in the process. Um, so that's um, how I started thinking about this. I did a lot of work in economics at Florida State. I also um, did a postdoctoral work at the Acton Institute, which is a very conservative libertarian um, institute. I just wanted to understand that perspective. So I did uh, work with them as well. So in essence, what I'll be talking about is global capitalism. Uh, and so in essence, what we, what we struggle with here in America is just a microcosm of, of a bigger problem, of, of a bigger issue, uh, which is global capitalism, um, where corporations um, have more power than, than states and governments and countries. You have corporations with bigger um, income and more revenue than some countries and with enormous power. And so that is um, the challenges that we'll talk about. I don't want to talk a lot um, about, I'll just run through the, um, the outline. There is a thesis I'd like to flesh out. Um, it is not an original idea, it comes from Harvey Cox, um, who's a sociologist, teaches at Harvard, um, and wrote a book um, entitled The Market is God. And what he has come to, he came to the conclusion that capitalism has become an idol, a false god, um, that is worshipped. And, and, th and the more I think about what's going on in this country with COVID-19 and how we're willing to sacrifice people's lives for the sake of the economy, um, that thesis becomes more and more true in my mind. Um, so I, I created this chart and I'll show that to you in a moment where um, I took some ideas from Cox but I just went hey what are the, the parts of organized religion and how do they correspond in this market religion and so that, that chart is just my ideas and looking through what a religion looks like and how this false religion um, has those markers. So I'd like to spend some time on that because I think it will be helpful in, in trying to understand and unravel this whole issue. So let me begin by saying that globalization is ancient. If you think about the Bible, you have um, empires um, rising and falling and controlling large swaths of land, which is a type of military as well as social globalization. So this is a human tendency that's pretty old, this tendency to create these large blocks of um, territory. Um, if you think about globalization as a form, a new form of imperialism, um, if you think about it as a way how the United States projects not only its political, but also its military and economic power, um, that's what we're talking about how capitalism has become, in essence, a global phenomenon, and, and the, the states that stand to gain, gain the most tend to be these developed economies. Um, interestingly enough, this whole modern global capitalist system began in 1944, uh, a year before the end of the Second World War, uh, leaders, economists, advisors, um, met in Bretton Hills, New Hampshire. And um, you know, the history books tell us there were representations from 44 different countries. We all know that the main forces um, were American and British. And, and the main idea was to establish an economic system, a worldwide economic system after the war, uh, one that benefited the allies, countries like France and the US and and uh, Great Britain. And so from that meeting, which was a quasi secret meeting, um, 
you have the establishment of the World Bank and the International, International Monetary Fund. Um, these two organizations having immense power when it comes to capitalism and how capital is distributed. Um, and then finally, years later, we, we have the World Trade Organization. Um, and so those three institutions basically are uh, the controlling factors of global capitalism. Um, they have a lot to say of how money is um, distributed, how it's spent, who gets money, um, how you help developing economies and so forth. Um, so you have the beginning of that in, the in 1944. Um, what we call globalization really exploded in the 1990s. Um, and so you have trade agreements, um, NAFTA, for example, being one of the first that established these huge trade zones. Um, so as I mentioned, globalization could be economic, um, it could be military, um, it could be cultural. And to give an example of cultural, um, if you travel all over the world, you'll see these symbols of American economy all over the place, right? Like Coca-Cola or like uh, people in the middle of South America wearing jerseys from American um, sport um, teams. Um, I had a friend who was from Ecuador and she told me once, oh, you have to try this chocolate. This is the best chocolate ever. It's better than American chocolate. And I said, okay, let me try it. And I tasted it. It was good chocolate. And I looked at the label. It was Nestle. So you have these huge international corporations um, with their foothold in each of these countries. And, and in a sense, it, it's a cultural uh, globalization, where we share the same culture, right? Um, we talk the same talk. I mean, you could talk to people any part of the world and they'll know about uh, Marvel movies or um, American pop, um, you know, icons. Um, legally, we have an international law as an international globalized legal system. Um, and politically, um, if you think about many of the countries that are connected uh, with um, countries that are the big players um, in this international economic system, um, they reap the benefits, right? And so you have um, political globalization where, for example, um, you know, you have companies and corporations that have the power to destabilize governments and change governments um, according to what they see is, is necessary. Um, really quickly, some of the characteristics of global uh, economics or global capitalism um, is that you have a rapid movement of goods, services, um, cash, for example, investment. Um, you can move money and capital very quickly um, and very quickly hurt or harm uh, an economy. Um, if you have these investors that can move their money really um, at a moment's notice, it just destabilized the, the local economy of a country. Um, accountability is an issue because as countries get more and more left out of the loop, corporations begin to have more and more power than countries do. Um, if you think about some of the power that corporations in this country have, um, well beyond the average person, um, that's what we're talking about, right? So there's very little accountabilities in these corporations. Um, and, and so there's very little um, desire to also regulate them and, and to uh, legislate for the benefit of the, the majority of people. Um, if I think about corporations like Amazon, um, you know, they make it seem as if, oh, they're doing us a favor, selling us everything we need, but in fact, um, putting the lives of workers in danger to sell us, you know, things to entertain us while we're locked in, right? And workers not having access to health care and, and other things and how difficult it is to do that, to, to try to legislate. Um, one of the things that we see more and more of is the privatization of services. Um, so more, I think, and I was thinking about this whole reopening school and I'm glad CW talked about it. And, and it makes sense to me that the pushing towards reopening um, is to punish those schools that don't reopen. 
so that if they don't reopen, they don't receive federal funding, and so we can begin to use that funding for private and for-profit schools or charter schools. So in essence, um, their privatization is, is always the goal of, of um, this global capital. Um, you have concentrated wealth, and you read that in pieces I sent you, how more and more power and wealth is concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer people. Something like 20% of the world's population controls 90% of the resources and wealth. Um, and so life then is, it has no meaning. We're just commodified goods. We're like anything that's bought and sold. Um, I, I think of the term that we use as essential workers, that's essential to capitalism, right? Essential to the profit motive. Um, I would call it an expendable because that's what we're really talking about. Um, the organization, you have a structure where there's very little power um, in, in the majority of those in that organization. It's all located at the top. Um, and ethics as well as um, commerce becomes a commodity. It's an instrument. Um, the policies that are enacted are policies that benefit corporations to the extent of um, cutting back regulations, cutting back uh, protections for consumers, and those things that, um, if you hear um, politicians from a certain party, um, you'll hear them about talking and railing about regulation. So that's what we're talking about. Um, the benefits of it, um, I think there's more harm than benefits, if you ask me. And so um, to the promotion of greater international understanding, that's what you hear all the time. Um, it's interesting who's heard and who speaks, right, in, in this international understanding. Um, creating this inter interdependent community so that um, the idea is if we are well off, then those countries that do business with us will also be well off. And so, um, you know, that metaphor of the rising, you know, sea and everyone who is participating in this economic system benefits, um, which is actually the opposite. Um, the promotion of human rights and freedom, well, it's hard to see as we become more and more powerful, um, we curtail freedom. Um, one of the things that's really interesting um, in the past 10 years, and this also goes hand in hand with this global capitalism, is that you see a rise of authoritarian governments. Uh, democracy is actually um, in retreat. We have more and more powerful men um, in China, in Russia, um, all across the world, um, Turkey, for example where you have a curtailing of democracy and more and more authoritarianism. Uh, and we're seeing that in our country as well, as a matter of fact. Um, and so this idea that, the, that global capitalism will help the economies of developing countries, which is a farce because the more money they're loaned, the more they're owed, and um, the lesser they're able to pay off that debt. They have to get rid of um, programs that help the average person, and in the process, um, the rich get richer, right? And the countries that are third world countries get more into debt. Um, so that's you know, like a brief summary of, of globalization and global capital. Um, so uh, before I move on to discussing the, the chart and the readings, and I'd like for that part, um, I'd like it to be more of a conversation so that you know, you tell me what you think is interesting, what we can reflect on. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about very briefly about this chart. And um, this is something, again, that I was playing around with based on the ideas from um, Harvey Cox. If you think, if you take a look at capitalism, and this is something that Cox mentions in his book, capitalism in America, um, has become a religion. It's become a false god. Um, it has its narrative. It has prophets. It has holy sites. It has martyrs. It has a mythology. It has everything you can think of uh, that is in an institutional religion is in 
the market or market capitalism. So for example, if you take this, the, this idea that's very prevalent in Christianity, that the Bible and the history of human beings is a history of salvation, um, that's mirrored in, in capitalism. Wait a minute, if you don't mind, can we see the chart? Can you put uh, up the chart? Like yeah. I, okay, so is, let me stop this one, I guess. Do you see it now? Not yet. Okay. Okay. So because that, I, yeah, I found that really fascinating. I can't see. Oh, it's your screen. Let's see. Oh, okie dokie. That doesn't sound too Latino. Okay, I'm sorry. Okie dokie. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, in essence, you have, for example, this history of salvation in Christianity. Um, there's a mirror also with the history of capitalism and then having, the, having this creation story and, and how um, the fulfillment of humankind is living um, well, right? And so that capitalism is a way for people to live well um, and, and promotes this sense of, of progress, right? Um, you have this also, and I'm not going to touch on all of them, but just to talk briefly on some of them, is that um, we have, depending on which religion you believe in, you have this idea of salvation. Um, salvation, a central theme, for example, in Christianity and Judaism and Islam. Um, the market also promises salvation. It, it promises people to be free. Um, and so that's kind of one, another parallel. If you think about sacred texts, um, for us, we have the Bible. Um, for economists, you have Adam Smith, you have Milton Friedman, you have Ayn Rand, um, Rand Paul, for example, named after her. Um, and so you have also these texts which are looked at sacred texts and people will recite. I mean, I, I think Paul Ryan was famous for standing and quoting Ayn Rand, um, almost as if, you know, almost akin to somebody standing and quoting the Bible. Um, there are theologians as well. There are theologians, we've mentioned them. They have prophets, just like Christianity has prophets and Islam and um, Judaism has. Think about the Fed chairman. Every time he speaks, it's solemn and his words are, are sort of like um, taken like, like a message from God, right? I can remember, um, you know, some of these Fed chairmen with one word and everybody scrambles to try to decipher what that means and what that means for the economy. Um, I, I mean, um, I call them econologians because, you know, you see them on CNBC and Fox um, Business and, you know, you see these spokespersons, right, for um, capitalism everywhere. Um, there's a priesthood. If you think about stockbrokers, there's a hierarchy. Think about these big investment firms. Um, there are sacred symbols uh, for Christianity, right? We have a calendar. Um, for the stock market, you know, those trimester reportings are like their calendar. Um, you have yearly um, reports. And, and so if you go down through the list, um, you'll see very clear parallels. You know, we have seminaries, they have business schools. Um, there's a belief in mystery, right? We believe in mystery and religion and for Christians, there are lots of mysteries. For um, the global religion of capitalism, there's the invisible hand, right, that goes around making everything right. Um, so you have the same thing that if you think about the attributes of God, um, God knows everything. Well, the market knows everything you need, right? Even before you buy something, um, the market establishes that you need to have it. Right, so it so it creates this idea. Um, the market is everywhere, just like God. Um, the market is all powerful. You know, when the market has a problem and it stumbles, oh, we didn't trust enough in the market, right? And so, like Christians, when you don't pray hard enough, you don't get what you pray for. It well, I have to work harder. Um, and so you have these parallels that I think are incredible, and. Um, the market has become a false deity, um, and it's in competition with Christianity. 
So when I have debates with family who tend to be more, you know, conservative, I have to interject uh, continuously and say, hey, we don't have a difference of opinion, we have a difference of moralities. And that this morality is dependent on how you view this country, right, and, and capitalism, and how I perceive and I have to be the same. So these are just some ideas, but the more, if you were to go through with these, each one of these, you'll see this, um, uh, these very clear parallels. And so how capitalism has even <coughs> become a false God. And so as Christians, we, as Christians and as people of good faith, um, because I, there are lots of non-Christians and non-believers in anything or agnostics or whatnot that, um, actually happen to believe that this system is, is run amok. Um, and it has to do a lot with how the, the market is seen. So um, just um, an interesting aside, but I think that part of the problem, if you look at globalized economy, um, that is the, the deity of the market becoming more and more powerful. <laughs> just like, you know, the God of the Old Testament in competition with other gods becoming more powerful. Um, as the Jewish people progressed. Um, so those are kind of ideas that I wanted to share with you. And um, and just at this point, I um, don't want to seem like I'm rambling on. Just get your impression and, and start a discussion. Um, so if you'd like to talk about anything about the readings or anything I'd like to I've said to this moment, then have that freedom. One of the things I've been thinking about when, while you're uh, going over this is it seems like uh, uh, global capitalism really loves endless war, but mm -hmm. it's really good in recent decades at limiting the scope of that war so it doesn't blow up very much that they spend a lot of capital building. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I uh, uh, wonder what your take on that is and uh, 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 what you have to say about the, uh, the idea of endless war being a product of glo globalization. Yeah, uh, that, that's a really interesting point. I, I share with my students, um, because I am a product, right, of the liberation theological movements in Latin America in the 1980s, um, particularly in light of, of Reagan, right, and, and Reagan's philosophy and ideology. Um, I remember at one point sharing with my students that, that the, in the Civil War and, and uh, El Salvador, the U.S. was arming both sides. <laughs> and so, you know, these guerrillas who were the enemies were actually using American weapons against the other side, which were defenders of democracy, right? Um, in, in one sense, <clears throat> you follow the, the money, and I think the arms dealers and manufacturers in this country have immense power. And, and you are right that in, in one sense, in order to feed the beast, you need to create right, these, these crises. Um, I also think that in one sense, and this is not something unique to me, there's a, a, a New York Times reporter who used to be a pastor, as a matter of fact, and basically left the church, his name was Chris Hedges. And he wrote a book um, entitled, War is the Force That Gives Us Meaning. And so for Hedges, in this globalized, in, in this you know, power hungry and money hungry government and country we live in, the only thing that brings us together is a good war. Um, financially, it seems to help. Um, it, it creates this sense of unity right at the same time that unity is exploited for the benefit of of capital um and a great example of that is think about 9 11 how far it was used to exploit um fear and to create this false sense of togetherness in order to 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 try out and create these new weapon systems right um and, and to continue to um at one point, right, we were talking about in the Clinton era of, of dismantling our military and how 9-11 ramped it up again, right? So in one sense, that's a very 
good insight because, um, yeah, I mean, that's a major industry. Um, so uh, I forget which reading it was, um, but one of the things I remember is that uh, one that you need to have actors large enough to contest with uh, multinational corporations, and those would be states and so or nations. So um, one of the things I'm wondering about is this rise of authoritarianism and protectionism. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that like affecting the power of these multinational corporations to like take over all the public spaces? Yeah, um, in one sense, and this is a, a this is a creation right of this globalized economy where you have these corporations that are headquartered in multiple countries and um, are not subject to any legal uh, regime. So in essence, um, they've transcended this idea of of accountability, right? Because they're too large to be account held accountable. Um, because they are found in so many different places and have so much power. Um, what's interesting is that that the authoritarianism in the in the capitalist framework is imitated right by the power structures, and so corporations now have the power to put into place people who are more akin to their philosophy of, of endless growth and exploitation of people as well as the environment. Um, so the, the idea that um, a corporation can contribute to, in our case, both political parties, right? Um, so that they are accountable to no one but those that contribute towards them. Um, the bulwark against that um, would be the United Nations, international cooperation, right? And so what's interesting is you see as countries um, through the international arena try to rein in these corporations, um, that's where you see the influence being, um, being projected. Um, think of, I'm thinking of Bolivia, which had a president who was a socialist um, and he had policies which were really harmful to some big international, multinational um, corporations and he was replaced um, and so the United, the international community couldn't do anything about it yeah. right and so you you see that at the same time as the international arena think of the United Nations trying to counteract um, at the same time you have countries like the United States on the mining them um, and the reason we do that is to protect our economic interests the other, the other example I was thinking about, William, is um, was the incident in Jamaica when Jamaica had a more socialist leadership. Um, we we helped the coup get him out, get him out of of a power, and and the advertisement told it all. So after the coup, the advertisement for vacationing in Jamaica was come back to Jamaica the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. And that was a signal to everyone that they were in charge. Yeah. David, oh, I'm sorry. You, you have, um, one of the articles talked about this, that there being two generations of, of human rights. Uh, the first generation dealt with international rights. The second generation dealt with economic rights. And so, it was dead on arrival because of the United States, because of uh, France, because of England, because it basically talked about countries having a right to rule their own economies and autonomy to make decisions in regards to the economy and politics. And as long as we could say, hey, you have a right, um, you know, to religion, to free assembly, to uh, protection from police and illegal seizures, but when you come to try to regulate corporations and regulate these economic interests, that's when you hit the wall. Um, and so that's, that bill is still there in the international um, 
in, in the UN, but we haven't actually ratified it because it would mean losing our economic interests. David, did you have a question? We kind of talked over you. Did you have something you wanted to contribute? Hey, Pat, did you have something, David? I thought I saw you raise your hand. David? You're muted. You have to take your mute off. There you go. Yes, sir. Okay, Thank you. There. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren has been arguing for regulation of capitalism. Uh, and uh, let me ask you uh, your view on uh, the effectiveness of her pr uh, proposals for regulation of, of capitalism. Is it possible to regulate capitalism effectively? Yeah, and that's a good question. We, we have made attempts in the past, right, to regulate, uh, for example, um, when it comes to the market and, and investments and um, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but, you know, we've had little incremental changes, enough to pacify us, but not to make really substantial um, changes. Um, the, the, the piece that I shared with you the Brubaker piece. She actually wrote that piece in 2001. And interestingly enough, there's a part there about, um, about Bernie Sanders wanting to regulate um, the market. That was 2001, he's still trying for that. So um, I think the long and short of it is that these economic interests are so entrenched in our political system that if there are changes they're they're small um the, the it I, don't, I would have thought that it that 2008 would have been the watermark that we would have gone back to protecting workers and emphasizing unions um regulating how you know how markets are are dealing with um with capital and revenue, I mean, putting caps on um, how much corporations can own, and, and it didn't happen, right? Um, because it's a very entrenched system. And, and I think it goes back to this idea that in our country, based on our political system, where the minute a politician is elected, he has to look forward to the next election, and start the whole process of campaigning and and um, getting funds that um, they're very much beholden to the interests of corporations and the powerful. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know if that's too you know gloomy an assessment. Um, I know there's one thing that. I, did want to emphasize is that usually if change is going to come, it's going to come from top, from bottom up. Um, usually it's not going to come from top down. And, and so that's, um, you know, economically, those are going to be the changes that, that occur. It's going to be local, that it's going to influence and impact, and then that's going to um, grow to impact the larger policies. Mm. But, it, but it, the short answer, it's hard. Um, it's, it's even if there is any sort of bill that protects, say, for example, um, workers, by the time it gets to the president's desk, it's been watered down and you have so many complicating factors that it makes it almost untenable, right? I'm thinking about that COVID bill where there was supposed to be all these provisions to prevent abuse. And by the time it got to the president and to his administration, those protections were gone. And, and the abuses that we're seeing now and how that money was distributed, particularly money for small businesses. Um, and so that's just an indication of the, what we're dealing with. So last week we talked about uh, the emergence of B corporations. Mm -hmm. And um, and by the way, again, thank you, Pac, and, and please tell Hannah. Um, and Sharon was with us, Sharon Welch was with us. 
do you see the emergence of B corporations as one of the steps toward changing the whole landscape uh, and maybe even a movement from the bottom up mm -hmm. that may start a start a, a way of being free of the dominance of multinational corporations. And with that, I want to ask you, William, I really do believe we're, we're in the midst of a cultural shift. And so if the cultural shift is real, mm -hmm. given the emergence of B corporations, do you see that as maybe an avenue of hope toward getting out of this global capitalistic mess we're in? I think to, to begin, I'd like to mention that we're all aware of the fact that in this country, corporations are considered people, right? And they have rights. Um, we have had Supreme Court rulings, um, which uh, I'm thinking about um, the most recent one that has to do with funding, right, for politicians, uh, money it equals free speech and corporations can give as much as they want towards um, these political candidates. So that's one of the things we're up against. Uh, Citizens United is the, the uh, decision. Um, and, and I'm thinking um, corporations are like chameleons, right? Um, if a corporation sees its bottom line being affected by a social problem or issue or question, they will change on a dime. Um, not that they have any sincere desire to change society. They just want to hold on to their market share, right? Um, I remember when this whole Black Lives Matter movement started, um, you didn't have many corporations on board, right? But now that's become a groundswell. All of a sudden you have this day where all the corporations go black and everybody's posting how they're with Black Lives Matter. Um, I think it's a matter of economic expediency. They're just doing it because it, it helps their bottom line, right, to be socially aware and active. Um, the same goes for any issues, right? Think about LGBTQ people and their rights and how corporations lash on to that. Um, the, the real change happens, I think, when people look outside of the market. Um, when people see local um, businesses and support um, the infrastructure that surrounds them um, in that way, you show the larger corporate interest that um, yeah, we, can, we can do without, right? Um, but that is something that runs counter to the capitalist model. We don't want 50 different economic models all throughout the country, right? We need one major market which we can exploit and we could use and we could um, grow from. Um, to your question, change is gonna come, but it's not gonna come through those huge, large corporate interests. Um, I, I, there are companies that I think are socially responsible, which I respect, but they're still beholden to their um, to their investors. <laughs> and so the bottom line will still be money. Um, and and th there's another idea, well, you know, these people give huge amounts of money, right? People like Bill Gates or now um, Bezos, but they made money through exploiting and crushing other businesses. So now, you know, they get this huge influx of money, they give it away and all of a sudden they're good guys. Um, but ultimately, you know, their practices harm the huge swath of the economy. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a difficult challenge, but I don't see our, um, our salvation there. I think it, it, it's grassroots efforts from churches and activists and NGOs and, uh, people who are really interested in their local communities and exacting change there. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to be too pessimistic, but. No, this is fine. Uh, we have a, a note from Jan Weaver. Jan says, uh, I got to find you again, Jan, sorry. Well, I lost your chat. You want to just say? Yeah, sure. Um, so Robinson wrote about non-capitalist systems being replaced by capitalist systems. What is a non-capitalist system? Um, yeah, if you think about 
in many native traditions, um, there are systems which are not uh, monetary, right? So that the, the, it's ex you have exchanges of um, uh, through bartering, through um, you know lending. Um, I think about in many countries where there, if you exchange goods for what other people have, right? So if I need this, and I'll exchange it with yours. Um, where you depend on the local community to meet your, your needs, right? And so in, in one sense, um, non-capitalist system, referring to these traditional systems that don't have market exchange and don't have um, the market as a model for trade and exchange. Um, so what what's happened is, for example, if a country wants to apply for funding or aid from the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, um, they have to subscribe to the market philosophy. They have to create an open economy, uh, a free market economy at that. They have to cut back on social spending. Um, they have to cut back on protectionism and laws that protect the local uh, workers and environment. And, and so in so doing, they're losing um, their self-identity, right? And falling into this gold line capitalist model. And in the process, creating the, a huge debt for themselves, which later on, um, by all estimates, most countries that borrow um, from these organizations pay back the, the um, threefold, right? And, and, and interest and never manage to scratch the principal. So, so in essence, what we're talking about, um, taking these non-traditional um, economies and, and transforming them into economies like ours. But they must have decided to borrow the money, right? Was it for infrastructure development or industrialization? I mean, yeah, it was yeah. a Faustian bargain, but. Yeah, yeah well, there's, um, there's a certain, I think it's it's a double-edged sword, right? Because in order to attract capital to create the industry um, that will feed and assist their people, they have to create infrastructure, right? They have to create legal systems that then are um, able to protect the economic interests of the investor class. So in essence, um, in order just to compete, they have to create the, the infrastructure and so all this money comes with um, uh, with conditions and preconditions and, and so forth. So if we loan money to a developing country that wants to establish an industry, well, um, yeah, you have to buy um, the earth movers and the equipment and what else that you need from us, right? From my country, from the U.S. Um, in the process, um, the loan, the big banks that loan the money. Um, get these exorbitant interest rates and they make money in the process. So what began as an attempt for me to try to compete and sell my goods in market now has become, you know, this dead weight of debt and, and um, basically losing your autonomy because the banks tell you how your money should be spent um, as part of the whole issue. I don't know if that addresses your, your concern. And it is a double-edged sword. Sure, Pat, please. Um, can you hear me okay? My, oops. Yes. All right. Um, well, historically, I, I agree with Harvey Cox that uh, capitalism is our current state religion. It's the global religion as Catholicism was a global um, and uh, what one of the threats to that global system was the printing press, and the threat to the current uh, religion is the internet, um, and it's challenging the the mythology that we're disparate, that we're disparate, that we're separate, that there's scarcity, and here we all are together. We're all in different locations, but we're together sharing. And so the myth of scarcity is, is, can be challenged. Mm -hmm. um, and so the answer, like I'm thinking, who is the current Martin Luther? You know, what, what, are the, what would be the 72 theses? 
Um, and so the answer is going to come from outside the structure of capitalism. Um, and um, and so we won't see it, we won't be able to see it from inside this mythology. Um, and but didn't, I mean, Martin Luther came from inside the Catholic Church. It's going to have to be maybe somebody from capitalism mm -hmm. that becomes the source of the theses. It's, it's an interesting thing if we think about technology, right? If the printing press as a technology for the Reformation, um, the internet as the technology for this new revolution. Um, the, the challenge is that the technology is owned by, you know, the, the power, right? By the uh, power elite. Um, so if you think about um, how tremendously useful technology was, I'm thinking about Facebook and social media, for the revolution that occurred in um, in Islamic countries, right, and um, how easily they were able to quash it just by monitoring and just t tinkering with technology, right? You think about um, something that for us is revolutionary. I I'm thinking of an example which is here, at, neither here nor there, but I'm thinking about how everyone here is talking about, hey, I just saw Hamilton in such a wonderful um, um, musical, and then hearing that in China, they just blocked it from, because, you know, that gives people the wrong idea, right, that, <laughs> of inciting revolution. Um, and, and so if you think about incidents where we've curtailed um, freedom, even on the internet, um, how my daughter was crying about net neutrality, net neutrality. And um, that's just a way of quashing voices that are uncom unpopular, right? They're there, but they're just submerged um, in the mass of data and information about the same issue. Um, I, I like to think about our salvation as being people powered. Um, just to give you an example, um, going back to the Black Lives Matter movement, it was three young women who said, look, I'm tired of this. And, and it has no centralized power. It has no structure. It has no hierarchy. It's just a movement that people just say, hey, enough is enough. We're going to move towards this and we're going to challenge the, the, sta the status quo. And so maybe, yeah, we could use social media as a stepping stone. But I think it, it's interesting that going back to the Martin Luther example, the church could have chopped off the head of that movement very easily if had they been able to get their hands on Luther, right? Um, not so much for Black Lives Matter when you have the leadership which is dispersed, um, where it, it's, it's so entrenched in the issues and the conflict that you can't identify a leader if, if you snatch one then another one rises to take its place so but that's that note, uh i just dropped a, a link in the chat to uh, uh a talk that was aired on kopn this afternoon that i thought was really inspiring and kind of appropriate to pack's question you know uh who's uh, uh where where's martin luther right now uh it was uh recordings from the mass poor people's assembly and moral march mm -hmm. on washington dc last month mm -hmm. and Barber, uh, very inspiring uh, it, it brought together a whole lot of different uh uh you know brought together black lives matter brought together uh minimum wage brought together environmentalism uh, a whole lot of different things that are in the air right now yeah. And I was sitting there thinking, I wish this was airing on every radio station right now. So mm -hmm. anyway, I dropped it in the chat. Uh, hopefully, uh, people might be interested in it. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a good um, point because, and there's a issue in um, the reading um, from um, the globalization reading, right? Um, one of the things that we talk about in ethics is intersectionality how these social issues are all intersect and intertwined and interconnected. So being a, um, a Latino man um, affects how I see the world, but they're intersecting dangers and intersecting issues that affect me as well. 
So I have to tell people continuously, um, I'm a person of color too. And so I've had run-ins with the police and um, have been um, in, you know, in these uncomfortable situations. Um, but the same thing I have to tell my students, yeah, you're so concerned with police shooting people of color, but what about those, you know, those Latino kids in cages, right, all around the border? Uh, where was your outrage there, right? So as, as, as long as we compartmentalize our problem and say, well, this is my problem as a gay man, or this is my problem as a black man, or this is my problem as a Latino man, and don't see how these intersect and how they're all our problems, um, then we won't really have true change. And, and I'm hoping that, um, that this is a movement that, that is long lasting, right? At the same time, knowing our, our system and our history, um, it's very easy to take somebody in power and just you know, smear them and ensnare them and entrap them and, and kill a whole movement, right? right. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I think decentralizing leadership, looking at these interconnected issues and problems, um, as Lawrence pointed out, is, is a common concern. I am intimately concerned with the lack of justice that women um, face in my society. Just like I'm as interested in how our society treats people of color and black men and how the police abuse their power. Um, I am intimately concerned with um, two people who love each other having the opportunity to marry and live a life of happiness and joy or displeasure and pain if, if someone seems <laughs> here. <laughs> their their needs as as a you know heterosexual man happily married um so yeah th this is the conversation that needs to continue and by the way the problems of missouri also concern florida um but we are so stuck into our little regional you know i, I hate to use this term but silos we talk about those and i get annoyed and at the university when we talk about silos, but um, if we look at our problems in isolation, um, it's, it's very difficult to exact real change. Yeah. One of, one of the things uh, when you brought up Martin Luther, I mean, I, I, I equate that with what happened. My fear is well, that with Black Lives Matter, the same thing will happen as it did with the civil rights movement. As long as Martin Luther King was the spokesperson for the civil rights movement and became the Luther, um, things went along pretty well. And then he's assassinated and leadership starts, well, the movement starts to fall apart. I think that's always a danger when charismatic leadership um, comes to the helm. And so trying to find a way to both decentralize and yet have someone like, um, um, I'm sorry, say his name again, Lyle. Um, Barber? Barber. Barber. William Barber. Um, there, there's always the risk between those two. By the way, I don't know, did you all hear William Barber when he was in Columbia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was he was awesome. He was awesome. Yeah. Other yeah, questions. Don't want to dominate. Other questions. Kind of interest where his voice. Um, he is such a powerful speaker, but if you watch him on cable, it's he's an afterthought. They don't bring him on, right? Because you know yeah. we want to entertain, and he's not going to create the conflict that other speakers will. Right. Agreed. Other questions? So, if I got you rightly, William, you think that the hope might be from the bottom up? Yeah. Okay. And I see change happening, particularly with, with this up-and-coming generation. Um, the ones that have a more more expansive worldview, but but they also have the most to lose, right? Because this is the generation that won't have the same economic opportunities that the rest of us had. 
that may not have a livable environment um, like we enjoy, right? And so they're pressed against the wall. Um, a lot of the, and, and to, just to give you an example, I, I teach a class um, on social justice. Um, and it's, um, it's an interesting class because we look at social justice movements and um, we look at historical theoretical frameworks. And um, from that class, I've had students who have basically heard everything we talked about and gone and did things that I could never imagine. I mean, I had one of my students, um, Mikhail Tyru, which you're familiar with, um, CW, um, he basically started this whole movement of in Daytona Beach when people apply for work, not to have that little box of um, felon on it. And this is a student in my class. Um, there's a girl now raising cane in Milwaukee, um, one of my students who is, she's day 32 of, of, <laughs> of being out there in the streets and talking to politicians and getting um, the city of Milwaukee um, to change the police structure. Um, and, and students will come to me and say, hey, you know, and they're doing amazing things. And I think it's the empower, how we empower them and, and just let them loose, right? Um, and so I remember I, I would say to myself, you know, when I retire, I'm going to raise hell. I'll go out there and protest and I'll do everything that, you know, I can't do now because I have a nice, comfortable position. And my students push me to the point where I got to put, you know, what I talk and what I say in action <laughs> and put my money where my mouth is. And, and I see a great promise in, in this generation. I, I, I hope that, you know, the, the, the enthusiasm and the fire doesn't go out. Uh, it doesn't get co-opted because that's another danger. But I think that there's hope in, in this. And, and, we just, and we just have to let them be, right? Um, I hear people in our churches say, oh, the young people are a future. No, they're a present. Um, in, in, you know, economics terms. And, you know, if, if I think about these students, they're going to say to me, they're going to say to me, hey, I don't really care about having a big fat bank account. <laughs> and if capitalism is going to be overthrown, it's going to be that lack of concern for material goods, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of promise in that. And they just organize. They'll say, hey, we don't like this. And before you know it, they're out there. Yeah. yeah. They don't ask permission. Right? And yeah. so I think that's what we're seeing. Yeah. Very good. Others? Anyone else? I think Angie dropped a uh, question in the comments there. See if you can pick her. Angie, thank you so much for being here. Uh, re mass information availability censorship. I'm sorry I can't video, but I'm wondering how you see the strategy of inciting distrust in information, such as whether fake news, facts, and the media. How much of a problem do you imagine that will continue to pose? That, that's a great question. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading on what they call deep fakes. Um, if you think fake news and these fake disinformation campaigns are bad, um, look into deep fakes where you can actually take a video and audio from a person and recreate this video that's so, that's so authentic that you can't tell it from, you know, from a fake. Right. So um, this information is only going to get worse, I think. Um, this side, and we have a president who basically incites people to distrust the media for his own um, ends. And so what's happening is that we basically created these dichotomies of news consumption where um, if you're a liberal, you'll stick to these outlets. And if you're a conservative, you'll stick to these. And you have this isolation. In, in essence, an echo chamber where you keep hearing the same thing. And, and I see this information on both sides, on both left and the right. Um, how we look at media and try to consume 
responsible media, I think, is a, is, is a responsibility we have. Um, I personally don't post anything or don't talk about anything unless I've looked at it and verified it from three or four at least um, verifiable outlets because of that tendency. Um, that is a challenge, but it could also backfire too. I mean, uh, if it comes to the point where um, Facebook, for example, which is another economic you know, conglomerate with, with too much power, uh, if people see, you know, this fakeness as being uh, a problem, they'll stop subscribing. And, and you know, as, as a platform, they'll, they'll lose its power and some other platform will come and take its place. So it's a two-edged sword, I guess. Um, I think vigilance, um, I think trying to be responsible as consumers of media. Um, here's another thing which I like to promote in the university. We need a media literacy courses <laughs> um, for our students, for our, for our people, um, how to responsibly consume this media that we're constantly being barraged with. Um, so it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think it's an important question. Um, it can't backfire. And, and even though I, I love to waste time on Facebook, I can't wait for its demise. <laughs> because as a platform, it does way too much um, to appease these conspiracy, conspiracists and loonies and fake news. Um, I think that's what we're dealing with, yeah. That's a good question. In the interest of, of looking at different news sources, one of, the, one of the hacks I've tried is looking for Al Jazeera's coverage of the U.S. Because very often Al Jazeera has a completely non-polarized non-U.S. central, uh, uh, you know, perspective and uh, can be really interesting reporting things that you don't see in the U.S. media about the U.S., yeah. uh, but they're also still a decent news organization. Uh, basically, all the Arab countries hate them uh, <laughs> because they report the truth over there, too. So I thought that was an interesting little hack in news sources. Yeah. It used to be that way, I think, with the BBC, but um, they got co-opted. Yeah. But I, I remember, I, it seems like that uh, earlier, the BBC was a good way of getting a perspective about the United States and what we do. Um, that wasn't, as you said, Larry, it wasn't centered in a U.S. perspective. Yeah. But again, like so many other things, uh, I think it, it's been compromised and co-opted. If, if you could find the Canadian broadcasting, they do a really good job of looking at us. And it's interesting. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly now, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Other questions, other statements? Well, I don't know about you all, but I really enjoyed it. William, thank you so much, man. Uh, thank you for being with us and taking time to 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 share your thought. And, and uh, I, I really appreciate you being here. And I'm getting hand claps on the screen and other people saying, nice job. Um, thank you, man. Do you have a closing comment you'd like to make? I'd like to... Um basically um, encourage um, you all to do the good work that you're doing in your local communities. Um, I, I think that one of the big things that I am teaching myself is to becoming um, more simple in, you know, my consumption patterns and, you know, what I buy and what I don't buy being more select um, and, and trying to make difference. Um, you know, one of the things I'm doing is I'm, you know, in the midst of this pandemic, I'm just going to local shops that I know that are businesses that are owned by people in my community and, and hoping little by little to make changes right on this level. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things that I, that I do want to emphasize is that when it comes to global capitalism, you know, that, that 
quick exchange of money is also true of information. And so it's important to keep on track of, of everything that goes on. And well, as I was just preparing for this, I was looking at the reading and saying, wow, this speaks to the moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, this speaks to this COVID-19 um, hellscape and, you know, the, the emphasis of, of going back to work and reopening and just to the extent of not caring about how many people die. Um, yeah. So they're all interrelated. And, and I think it's, if you read the article, of the Globalization Reader article from the lens of COVID-19, um, you'll see these connections and say, oh, wow, um, this is what we're up against. But I'd like to thank you for listening to my meanderings. And <laughs> oh, man, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank all of you for, for being here. Um, next week, we, we will have Tracy Wilson Kleekamp with us. Um, and so uh, I hope that you all will, again, uh, come and participate and bring someone with you. Uh, the old Baptist is coming out in me. Evangelize, evangelize, evangelize. Uh, tell people if you if you found it to be good, then uh, other people will too. So make sure you tell folks, and we'll meet at the same time, same station, uh, seven o'clock on next Tuesday. Again, William, thank you, man, for being with us tonight. Everyone, pleasure. Thanks. Thank good you. night. Thank you.